Welcome back to our session on the birth of astronomy today. And so we are going to be talking about what ancient astronomers knew, what ancient people knew, and how does that compare with what you indeed know today and what's going on out there. And so first thing I want you to notice is I've got a globe out in front of me. Uh, this globe happens to be a rather old globe because you can see that, well, you guys probably can't, but I can, see that we've actually got some of the Gemini missions on here. Uh, so these Gemini missions occurred back in 1962, so this is basically a globe from the early 60s. The other thing is, I'm sure you probably can't see, but it has the uh, planets down here at the bottom. So this is a globe where they're going to use. But I want you to notice that the globe is tilted. It's kind of tilted at an angle there. And so we're going to talk about that tilt of the axis and what indeed that goes ahead and shows us about our place within our solar system and how we view the solar system and the sun because of the tilt of our axis. So guys, let's go ahead and start talking about the birth of astronomy. Now, you will see on the slide right here that has nothing to do with the birth of astronomy, but it does say picture of the day. And I want you guys to get used to going to this website about every couple of days, and there's a new picture every day there from the, what's called the Astronomy Picture of the Day website. Sometimes you'll have pictures of the solar system, sometimes you'll have pictures of just constellations, sometimes there'll be galaxies. You just never know what's going to be on here, but it's a nice, full website. It kind of gives you a general view of what's going on, as well as in a small little description of whatever that picture is. And a lot of the pictures that I actually use out of here uh, for this class will be from the astronomy picture of the day. A lot of them are from NASA. Several of them are from a lot of other sources. So guys, get used to just going to that website every couple of days and see what's going on. So first thing I want you to do, as we've talked about before, is I want you to get used to looking up. Now, when you go outside and you look up, you obviously see the sun if you're looking at it during the day. But I want you to go out at night. I want you to look up and see if you can figure out what your place is in the universe based on the fact that you're standing on the Earth. And as it turns out, it's really hard not to know that you're not at the center of the universe. Because we see everything rising in the east, comes through and it sets in the west. And that's true of everything. Everything rises in the east, sets in the west. And so it does appear that then the Earth is at the center of the universe. But now, do we know that the Earth is the center of the universe? Well, definitely not. Uh, if you have children, or you remember what you were like when you were about one or two, yes, probably everything did revolve around you, and you were the center of the universe. Fortunately, as you grow up, that changes just a little bit. And so we're going to look at what happens and how we were able to determine that we were not at the center of the universe. And so the picture that you see right here is taken from, again, Australian Observatory, so it's taken down in the Southern Hemisphere. And these are star trails. And you can see at the very center, you look like you have small little concentric circles and they get bigger as we move out. And we're looking down right now toward the southern celestial axis. And so we're going to talk about what that means here in just a minute. But I want to give you a feel for the fact that the sky really does appear like it's turning completely around us. So if we start looking at the sky above us, we're going to think about something called the celestial sphere. Now I want you to think of this globe that I have in front of me. And I want you to think about standing on this globe and just looking up. And so you're going to see this sphere above you where the stars are. Okay. If I look behind me, okay, my celestial sphere for this class, you know, I've got a nice little galaxy behind me. I've got this area of the sky that I'm looking at. And so that's that imaginary sphere around the Earth on where we have all the objects in the sky that reside. This point is just kind of a nice flat surface, we'll put the depth on it later on. So right now we've just got this nice celestial sphere. Then as we take, if I come back to my Earth, okay, so here's my Earth, and we do have these celestial, these poles coming through the Earth. Well, I want you to take these poles, and I want you to extend them out to the celestial sphere. So we've got a north pole that gets extended out to the celestial sphere. We've got a southern pole, which I know is kind of hard to see, that also gets extended out to the celestial sphere. Those are called the celestial poles. Now, 
at our North Pole, when it gets extended out to the celestial sphere, we have a star called Polaris that is there. And we're going to look at Polaris a little bit later. There isn't that star that corresponds to the southern hemisphere. In fact, if you remember that picture that I just had there, notice that you don't have a nice bright spot right at the center. If that was the northern hemisphere, you would indeed have a nice bright star there, which would be Polaris. So if you can go outside at night, find Polaris, you can always know which direction is north. And we're going to talk a little bit about stars in terms of constellations today. And then the next two sessions that we're going to look at are going to be how to find constellations in the sky. So we've got our celestial sphere. We've got our celestial poles. And now if I come back to the Earth, you know that we've got an equator that goes around the Earth. Well, I want you to take that equator and just extend it into the celestial sphere as well. And that becomes our celestial equator. Now, we also have something called the zenith. And the zenith means that it's just literally the point right over your head. So that means as you change positions, that zenith is going to change along with you because you're looking straight up. So if I looked at uh, the horizon then, so you've got your zenith, which is straight up. You've got your horizon where the celestial sphere then goes ahead and meets the ground. Now, your celestial sphere runs 360 degrees around us. So does the horizon. So no matter which way I'm looking, I'm always going to see where that celestial sphere runs into the horizon. So 360 degrees. However, when I look at my zenith, I can go from zero at the ground, nine degrees above, and then coming back down at 90 degrees. Now this kind of gives you a, an example or a picture of what I was talking about with the celestial equators and the celestial poles. So you kind of see where our Earth is, and you just extend those poles out into the celestial sphere, and then same way with the Earth's equator, you just extend it out into the celestial sphere and it becomes a celestial equator. And here's your zenith, which is just your point overhead. And then notice you can also then see that celestial sphere and you can see then where it intersects then your horizon, the ground that you're actually standing on. Now your altitude Wherever you are is going to be the same as the altitude of the North Pole. So the altitude of the North Pole will be equal to the altitude of the observer. So if I go out and I look at where my altitude is in Springfield, and I look at the North Pole, then that's what the altitude of the North Pole is going to be at. So we're going to come back to that a little bit later when we really start looking at locating Polaris and locating the uh, constellations. So don't forget that. Come back to that. So now we need to talk about some terms relative to constellations. And one of them is called a circumpolar zone. Now that circumpolar zone is a zone that, since it says polar, you know it's got to be around the North or the South Pole. And those are the constellations that are visible basically 365 days a year. Now, certainly also means that you've got clear skies, which being in Missouri, you know that we don't have clear skies that often. So if I look at the circumpolar region or circumpolar constellations, those are constellations that are visible all year round. However, they will turn around Polaris because Polaris, remember, is where our North Pole intersects then the celestial sphere. So the entire sky looks like it is rotating around Polaris. Then we just have constellations in general. And constellations to the ancient people were very distinct personalities that were put up in space. So it was a way of honoring their gods or their heroes, like Hercules, Orion, things like that. They put them in the heavens. Nowadays, when we talk about a constellation, we are not just talking about the star pattern. We are talking about regions in space. And there's about 88 regions or sectors that we have. And then we have planets, which are wanderers in the sky. Because if I look at the stars, I find out that the background of stars don't move. What does move, however, are the planets that do wander among those stars. And so as you get used to looking at those constellation patterns, and you get to where you recognize them and you go outside and, hey, there's something different that you didn't see last night, well, you're probably looking at a, a planet that has changed its position against the background of stars. Now we also talk about something called the ecliptic, and that's the apparent path that the sun takes through the stars. And it's inclined about 25, or excuse me, 23 degrees due to the Earth axis, which is about what the Earth's axis 
is inclined as, about 23 and a half degrees. And so if I then look at where the sun is as we go around the sun during a year, then it's going to appear to move through the ecliptic. Now, for those of you that realize this is an astronomy class and not an astrology class, well, those 12 constellations that are along the ecliptic tend to be the constellations of the zodiac. And so that zodiac is an 18 degree wide belt that is indeed centered on the ecliptic. So if I look at this picture, then you are looking then at the constellations of the zodiac. And so you see there's a sun. You can see where the earth is. And you can see that the earth is moving. Well, as the earth moves and then we look at the sun and then we look at what's going on at night, then those are the constellations that we view as the constellations of the ecliptic. And so the reason that you have your sign is that's the constellation that the sun was in during the time that you were born. Like if we're talking about my sign, I'm a Scorpius. So I know that Scorpius then was where the sun resided, but I also know that I can't see Scorpius during the winter. My birthday's in November. I have to wait until the summer to be able to see Scorpius as a constellation. And it makes sense because if the sun is in that constellation during your birth, then we're not going to be able to see that constellation at night. At night, we're going to see essentially 180 degrees apart. Okay. Now, if I go back and I look at the constellations of the zodiac, for those of you that are really astute, you'll know that I have 13, not 12. Well, that's because 2,000 years ago, when there were those nice 12 constellations, well, things have changed a little bit in 2,000 years. And so we do end up with a 13th constellation. And so, guys, there's really 13 constellations of the zodiac, not 12. I do want you to learn those constellations. Capricorn, we start with the first one. And we'll talk about in the sky when we star, star jump exactly where these things are. You can see I want Capricornus, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, there's Scorpius, there's mine, then Orpheus, and then Sagittarius. Now, if I go back to this picture that I showed you earlier of the zodiac, You'll notice that it's not really on there. That's because it doesn't really generally get put on those constellation maps. And it's just a little part of that, the constellation that comes into play. So we really don't really worry about it. But technically, there are 13 constellations of the zodiac. So now let's go ahead and talk about what astronomers knew that were ancient astronomers. And ancient, we're talking about anything before about the 1600s. Okay, so I want you to think about if you go outside at night and you look up, look at those star patterns, look at what happens in the sky, look at the path of the sun, look at the path of the moon, the path of those wanderers, which we know are planets. So what do you know about the ancient skies? There were no telescopes. All you had was basically the ability to go out and observe. And so what did those ancient astronomers know? Well, first of all, they knew the length of the year, which is pretty straightforward. You know, the sun moves about one degree per day against the background of stars, and so therefore it takes about 365 days to go ahead and go around the sun. Now, you know that it gets adjusted about every four years, as we call leap year, because it's approximately one degree per day. And so every four years we go ahead and adjust it by one day to get everything in a nice, easily recognizable pattern. So they certainly knew the length of the year. They also had a working calendar, and it was various calendars, depending on what particular culture you were talking about. But they had various calendars, and a lot of times they were based on different stars. If I look at when, let's say, this particular star is rising over the Nile, I know that that's when my year has started. I know that this is a good time for me to go ahead and plant crops. So it wasn't necessarily just based on the sun. It was based on other things in the sky as well. They certainly recognized common astronomical objects, and there were nine of them. It's not the nine planets, guys. Um, they included things like the sun and the moon. Looking at the constant, or looking at the planets that were very visible, which would be Mercury, Venus. Okay, then we've got Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and we've certainly got the moon. 
So those are very recognizable, and they knew where they were and what the patterns were within those skies. So that means these ancient astronomers were very good observers. And not only were they good observers, they tended to record then the data over very long periods of time. So they recognized then exactly what was going on with those patterns. They also understood that the Earth was spherical. That was understood by Pythagoras about 500 BC, as well as Aristotle. And Aristotle was about 350 BC. They were able to go ahead and see shadows on the moon, as well as being able to see different stars during the time that you were traveling in the oceans. And to be able to watch a ship as it headed out to sea get lower and lower and lower then where you were able to see more of the mass and it finally then just went ahead and disappeared. So they did understand that the Earth was spherical. It's not a flat surface. You're not going to go fall off of it. Although we still do have today a flat Earth society. Sometime, kind of interesting, go look up their flat Earth society. There's still people that believe that if you get to the end, we're going to fall off. They also knew the sun was further away from the moon due to the fact that we had solar eclipses. So they not know exactly how big things were, but at least they had a good feel for the relative sizes. They also understood the moon's phases. That's something we will get into real shortly in terms of what is the phase of the moon, as well as when are you going to see certain phases. And I would like for you guys to get used to going out and looking at the moon and finding the moon. So it's very easy to see when you're talking about a full moon. When can I see it during the day? When do I see it in the morning? When do I see it in the evening? When do I see it at 3 o'clock at night? And so kind of get used to when you look out, when you go outside, just look up and see if you can see the moon. They also recorded newer guest stars. And these were stars that weren't there the night before that flared up very brightly and in some cases would be brighter than the sun. Well, you know, if you're kind of an ancient astronomer and you're watching these things and all of a sudden you go outside and there's a star that's incredibly bright, what does this mean? What is this telling you? Because they were also tending to be very superstitious. So what did that newer guest star mean? Nowadays we know those were supernova explosions and we'll go look at some of those and we can tell by how old they are exactly when they appeared in the Earth's sky. So now let's go ahead and talk about the circumpolar constellations. These are the constellations that are visible 365 days a year. The first one and probably the most recognizable constellation other than Orion is going to be the Big Dipper or Ursa Major. Once you find the Big Dipper, Look at the two pointer stars and you can easily then find the Little Dipper and the star Polaris. And that's the star that the entire sky appears to turn around. Then there's three other constellations that are circumpolar constellations. And those are Cassiopeia, Cephas, and Draco. And like I said, the next session that we talk about, I'm going to show you where those circumpolar constellations are, and we'll talk about how you can find those constellations by star jumping. That's the easiest way to do it. You find something that's recognizable to start with, and you go from there to this particular star, and from this particular star you know is that constellation. Now, I know that this is going to be recorded both, and you might be viewing it in the winter, the summer, or the spring. And so kind of depending on what semester you're looking at, there will be different sessions that I will do for winter constellations, summer constellations, and fall constellations. So whichever class that you're taking it in, you can kind of ignore those other two and just look at the one for your particular time of year because I do want you to get to know those constellations and be familiar with it. And we'll talk about a constellation map that comes from skymaps.com that I'll have you pull down every month. And I do want you to get outside away from the city lights Take a flashlight, which has then the light covered with a nice red cellophane. And remember, I want you to take somebody you know, love, and trust. Do not go outside and look at these constellations. Outside, in the dark, by yourself. Let's always be aware of that little safety issue. Okay, so there's other constellations depending on whether this is a fall, winter, or summer course. Those are Hercules. Very, very big constellation during the summer. There's Corona Borealis, there's Boutes. It's got the bright star Octurus, which is very easy to see. Then there's Libra, then Virgo with its bright star Spica. Then Leo, which is a lion, one of the um, zodiac constellations. And its bright star Regulus. These bright stars are stars that we're going to use to be able to star jump and find our way around the sky. 
Then we've got Cancer, Gemini, Castor and Pollux then are the two stars in Gemini. Perseus, Aquila with Capella, or excuse me, Auriga, let's get the right constellation. Then there's Taurus with the very bright red star Aldebaran. When we get into the section on stars, I want you to remember these stars because we're going to come back and talk about the characteristics of these stars and how they compare them with the sun. And then, of course, there's Orion with Betelgeuse and Rigel. And then Canis Major, Canis Minor with Cirrus and Procyon. Then Hydra, Pegasus, Andromeda, and Cygnus with its bright star Deneb. I want to say we still have more. There's lots of constellations out there, guys in terms of the ones that I want you to know. So Aquarius, my favorite little constellation was looks like a little dolphin, which is Delphinus. So it's because it's my favorite one, we're also going to find that one. Then Lyra with a bright star of Vega. Vega, along with Altair and Deneb, are the three brightest stars that you see in the summer, and so we call those a summer triangle. If you go outside, probably don't want to do this so much in the winter, but if you're outside during the summer, take a nice blanket, lay down, you know, about, oh, 15 minutes before it really gets dark and let your eyes get dark adapted and you'll start seeing the bright stars pop out. And those are the first three stars you're going to see pop out in the summer sky. Then we've got Sagittarius and Scorpius. And Scorpius has got Antares. And then there's Libra and then Capricorn and Cetus. So uh, the other two that we have are the Pleiades and Aries. And so that kind of gives you an idea of those constellations. Now, those are constellations that you see over a period of year. So keep in mind, guys, you're not going to see all of them in the one semester that you're taking this class. But hopefully, what you will do after you take this class, then whatever the next season is, you'll kind of already have those constellations and those star maps, and you'll still be able to go outside and look up and find those other constellations even after this class. Now I'm going to jump back then to what ancient astronomers knew because they certainly knew those patterns and a lot of the patterns that we have were named from the ancient Greek and Romans. Okay, so now I come back to about 200 BC and this is Eratosthene and what he did was he measured the circumference of the earth. Now unfortunately we're not really sure how close he came because of the uncertainty of the measuring system he used but at least the idea that he used to go ahead and determine the circumference of the Earth was extremely intelligent. You know, I think sometimes we do not give our ancient cultures enough credit for what they were able to do without all the technology that we have today. And so what he did is he said, okay, let me think. If I know that the sun is straight overhead on this particular day, and I can tell that because I've got a really big well and I can see that the sunbeams go directly down the well. So that tells me that the sun is straight overhead. Well, if there's a certain city to, let's say, a certain distance away, that sun's not going to be straight overhead at that particular city. And if I know how far that is, and I know what my shadow is doing at that particular city on that particular day at that particular time, then I can use simply trig, because I did know trig, sines, cosines, tangents, those kinds of things. I can figure out what the circumference is of the Earth because I know the distance between, in this case, Cyrene and Alexandra. And he knew that distance because he hired somebody to physically walk that distance. And so that's exactly what he did. Knowing that distance between the two cities, knowing the angle or the shadow that was produced at Cyrene, then he was able to figure out what the radius of that triangle was. And the radius then happened to be the radius of the Earth. All you have to do once you know the radius is go ahead and find the circumference from that. And like I said, very ingenious method of being able to do that. That is still repeated a lot nowadays, um, and it works just as well now as what it did back then. Like I said, the only thing is we're just not sure what his system of measurement was. Unfortunately, that's something that didn't come down with him. So guys, it's extremely important when you are making these measurements and anything that you do to record it so that people do understand and can reproduce your data. Okay, then we get about 260 BC and we're talking about Aristarchus. And he was suggesting that the Earth indeed moved around the Sun, not the fact that the sun moved around the earth. 
And remember, right now, if you're back with the ancient cultures, the Earth is the center of everything. The Earth is the center of your universe. And so it turns out it's very, very hard to go ahead and tell that's not true. But what Aristarchus did not observe is he didn't observe parallax. Okay, so hopefully your next question is, what's parallax? Okay, guys, I want you to hold your finger straight out in front of you and close one eye. Okay, now I want you to look at what you see directly behind your finger. And now I want you to close that eye and open the other one. And notice that the apparent background is switching depending on which eye you have open or closed. Well, that's parallax. Okay, and so what Aristarchus felt like is if I looked at the earth and I looked out at the sky and then six months later I did that, I should be able to see something that is changing because my position of observation is changing. And I never did see that, or at least he didn't. And you're not going to because those stars are so far away. Even the sun is so far away. And so he tended then not to go ahead and believe what he thought because there wasn't any physical data go, to go ahead and back it up. Nowadays we know he was certainly right and it was just the fact that they are so far away that he was never able to go ahead and observe that parallax. Then we have Hipparchus which now we're looking at about 150 BC and a lot of the measurements that we have today came from his measurements back in 150 BC. Hipparchus was able to define the positions, the direction, and the magnitude, which is basically the brightness, of about 850 stars. And he did that with an amazing amount of precision. And so we still use that catalog that he produced today to go ahead and know that, you know, in 2,200 years or so, we can tell how much those stars have moved from when he originally observed them. So very helpful, you know, imagine that your data is still being used you know, more than 2,000 years after your death to still give us really good positions. And so we can tell now what has been going on with those 850 stars. He also recognized the precession of the Earth's axis. Now, I want you to think about the fact that you have a top, one of those little spinning tops, and I want you to think about spinning it. And in fact, if you'll see on this little video, you can see how that is spinning. And then notice that the procession of that top, it doesn't stay straight up. It actually goes ahead and rotates a little bit. And so that's what the procession of the Earth's axis is. And right now, our axis points toward Polaris, but it won't always point toward Polaris. And so as you can see in this little spinning top, that's a procession of the axis. And so Hipparchus did go ahead and recognize that. Well, based on those measurements, now we can look at those stars and we can see how those have changed due to not only the movement of the stars themselves, but due to the precession of the Earth's axis. And then we have Ptolemy. And these are people that are extremely important relative to looking at what the ancient astronomers knew and how then our ideas of astronomy developed through these. Ptolemy was about 140 BC. And what he did is he constructed basically a geometric representation of the solar system. And he looked at epicycles, and I'll show you what those are in just a second here, that predicted the positions of the planets for basically any time and date. And so Ptolemy was real interested in trying to be able to say, okay, based on this date, and I know that, let's say, two years from this date, I want to know where those nice common objects such as the Earth, such as the Moon, such as the Sun, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or excuse me, let's go the other way because those planets weren't known, but looking at Mercury and Venus, where are those planets going to be? And I want to be able to predict those. And so he used these epicycles, which are basically circles within circles within circles, which is a very complicated system to go ahead and try to explain the patterns that he saw in the sky. Now, at 140 BC, I want you to think about what you know about a circle. A circle was considered to be the perfect geometric representation. And so Ptolemy, because we were talking about celestial things, assumed that everything was perfect. And so he used circles within circles within circles. Nowadays, we know that the orbits of the planets and we know the orbits of stars, things like that, are not circles. But Ptolemy so much believed in that perfect sphere that that's where these epicycles came from. And so you can kind of see what those epicycles look like here. 
very, very complicated trying to explain the motion of these stars and these planets. The other thing that he was able to do was to explain and predict Mars's retrograde motion. Now, this was an amazing the fact that he could predict this based on all these little epicycles. So now what's retrograde motion? Well, normally you've got things that are going around the sky in one direction. They start in the east, set in the west. But if I look at Mars, I find out that Mars starts east to west, and then Mars backs up. And then after a while, it starts going forward again. So that's an apparent backwards motion through the sky. And notice the word apparent. Mars doesn't really back up, but it certainly appears to be. Well, that gave us some clue about where Mars is relative to us. And it was the fact that Mars is outside of our orbit. It's on further out. And we can explain that retrograde motion because of where our position is relative to Mars. Mars tends to be in front of us a little bit. Then we get in front of it. So when we're looking back, it appears to be backing up. And then it will tend to catch up with us. And we'll look at that a little bit more when we go ahead and uh, look at what's going on within the sky. But the fact these epicycles were able to go ahead and explain Mars's retrograde motion was an amazing thing. Then we have Copernicus. Now, we're going to look at the two competing ideas of what's going on within the universe. Well, Ptolemy said the Earth was at the center, everything went around the Earth. Nicholas Copernicus, which is about 1500 AD, so notice the time difference, guys. Ptolemy lived about 150 years BC, Copernicus is 1500 AD. Okay, so the entire time before Copernicus came along, the universe was assumed to be as Ptolemy constructed it. Okay? Copernicus is recognized really as the father of modern astronomy because what Copernicus did is he displaced the Earth in the center of the universe. Copernicus believed that the sun should be at the center, not the Earth. And this is Copernicus, relatively young man here, looking at what's going on up in the sky to try and determine exactly what's going on. For him, it didn't quite make sense with the observations that were being made and just the simplicity of what the universe would look like if you made the sun the center and not the Earth. So he proposed that the sun indeed was the center of the solar system. Now, also notice, guys, the solar system, not the universe. Okay. And so we have this geocentric, which is Earth-centered, versus the heliocentric, which is the sun-centered. And as we know nowadays, you know, it certainly is the heliocentric and not the geocentric. But it took Copernicus coming along about 15 AD, 1500 AD to really go ahead and start with that idea. And it was certainly very hard and simply was not accepted for a really long period of time. And in fact, it really didn't completely fall until Galileo came along in the 1600s and actually was able to use a telescope to look at some things on Jupiter that really put that final nail in the coffin, whether it was an Earth-centered or a Sun-centered solar system. Uh, so Galileo is credited with the beginnings, basically, of modern science because of the fact that he did not invent the telescope, but he did use the telescope to see what was going on, basically, up there. Like I said, a lot of times he's given credit with inventing the telescope, but he didn't. You know, he certainly did use it. And this is Galileo. And that is one of his first telescopes that he made based on letters that came from the inventor of the telescope on exactly what was going on. And this was a refracting telescope, and we'll talk a little bit later about the difference between reflecting telescopes and refracting telescopes. So this one happens to be a refracting telescope, which means it's made from lenses. So let's look at some of Galileo's contributions to ancient astronomy, or modern astronomy, since Copernicus and Galileo certainly are considered to be, then, the fact that we do have modern astronomy now. And so he supported Copernicus's view of the world. But remember, Copernicus said everything went around okay, the sun in the solar system, and everything did not go around the Earth. And so we're going to come back to this when Galileo starts looking at Jupiter, because we're going to look at the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Galileo discovered sunspots on the sun, and he did that by taking his telescope and looking at the sun. 
Now, hopefully, guys, you realize that's not a smart thing to do. In fact, Galileo probably destroyed his eyesight. He certainly had problems the rest of his life really being able to see well because every night he went out and took his telescope and looked at the sun. So he did end up eventually having problems with blindness toward the end of his life. But he discovered sunspots on the sun. He also observed phases of Venus. He also was able to describe details of the lunar surface, the fact that you saw craters up there, that you saw uh, mountains, that you saw all kinds of features on the moon itself. Now, he discovered the four moons of Jupiter. Now, remember I said that when you think about what Ptolemy said, is that everything goes around the sun? Excuse me, Ptolemy said everything goes around the Earth. Okay, Copernicus came along and said, well, no, we have things then within the solar system that are going around the sun. What Galileo did is Galileo observed Jupiter, and he observed four moons that were not going around the Earth, and they were not going around the sun. They were going around Jupiter. And those are the four Galilean moons, and that's Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And I showed you some examples of those when I, we had those tour of the solar system and tour of the universe, looking at what I want to do the next time I take my vacation. Remember those vacation slides I showed you? And Io was the one of them that was very, very active, had volcanoes going off all the time. Well, those are the four major moons of Jupiter which were going around Jupiter. And Galileo was able to see them go behind Jupiter on one side and appear on the other side of Jupiter. And so those really did go ahead and put that final nail in the coffin and the fact that the Earth was not the center because here was something, there was tangible evidence that Galileo was able to observe those moons going around Jupiter. That's also why they have the distinction of being called the Galilean moons. He found the Milky Way was composed of a multitude of individual stars. Take a nice pair of binoculars, go outside, look up at the Milky Way, and you can see a lot more stars than what just your naked eye is going to go ahead and show you. Now, one of the things that Galileo did is he wrote about these discoveries in the common language. And so he was able to get it out basically to whoever was out there and to the general public. Now, unfortunately, he also then tended to clash with the Roman Catholic Church, who censored his ideas. And in fact, during the latter part of his life, he was certainly under house arrest because of this, um, in terms of saying that you know, the church did not have the final say, the fact that there were things that were going on. And so, unfortunately, he did clash quite a bit with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, notice, guys, that in 1992, 1992, the church did go ahead and admit that it had made an error in trying to censor Galileo's ideas. And then, like I said, he was also kind of blind from looking at the sun through the telescope. But once those ideas got out to the common public, the common man, and they were written in a language that they would understand, you really started having the widespread ability of those people to look at what was going on and to start really thinking about what was going on in the sky. This is his, uh, where he was buried. And you can see that he has definitely given credence for basically expanding the universe and opening it up. Um, to the universe that we look at today. Okay, guys, so with that, what I want to do is go ahead and finish the session. Remember, the next three sessions that you're going to see within the list are going to be the constellations. So just pick out which particular constellations you need to go ahead and watch. I want you to go to skymaps.com for the particular month that you're in, and I'll have you do that every month to go ahead and pull down the sky map for that particular month. So we'll do some sky jumping for the next session, and then we'll come back and start looking at Kepler's laws and Newton's laws and some more of that background so that you can understand what's going to happen when we get out into looking at the planets and the stars and out beyond. So with that, guys, I'll see you next time. Have a great day.